Here we go. Welcome, everybody. Welcome, Laura, to uh, to the our latest and greatest uh, podcast we're doing here at Omidly. Uh, thank you for joining us. Yeah, it's great to be here, Phil. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. So for those you don't know, Laura is a, an investor and advisor to Omidly, uh, but she's also a security veteran and has been part of the security space for a long time. She's founder of SafeStack, which is a, a community-centric online learning platform that takes flexible and people-focused approach to ongoing cybersecurity education at a time when it's uh, when it's never been more needed. So thank you for joining us again, Laura. It's great to have you uh, on uh, on the on the show. And today we're going to talk uh, a bit about uh, security and startups and people, uh, why we should yeah. be taking a person-centric approach to security, what what's involved, what does that actually mean, uh, and and we're going to talk all about that. Um, sort of in the context of business and startups, um, but it's really applicable to any organization um, as we go through. So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Phil. I'm founder and CEO of Omidly. Uh, we make uh, cybersecurity software to help uh, to help businesses build, manage, and scale their security programs. Uh, we're a young startup, a couple of years old, and uh, we are doing a weekly show uh, all about security, startups, and leadership. Uh, and so we'll have, be having guests re on a regular basis. Um, we aim to do the show around 1 p.m. New Zealand time every week uh, on LinkedIn, and we'll be syndicated into uh, other places uh, on the internet as well. So please join us and, uh, and hope you get some value out of it as well. So Laura, tell us about, uh, tell us about you and your background. Awesome. Well, I'm going to, firstly, Phil, I'm going to call you up on calling me a veteran. And I've been around a while. My goodness, uh, you made me feel old. Um, but I guess in a way it's true. But yeah, we don't say it in polite company. Um, so I've been doing software development and then later security for 20 plus years right now. I hide the greys very well. Um, <laughs> but that's been through a range of things. Um, a lot of it with very fast paced organizations. So whether that was fast paced missions inside a bigger organization or high growth companies. Um, and my interest in, in this world, my mission, if you will, um, and I'm very mission driven as a person, is to try and, and make sure that we have security skills and ability in all of our people in, in all of our organizations. And historically, that's not always been the case. Uh, so we mm. often wait for an organization to be big enough or to have enough budget. Um, and I think the time has come now for us to really think about this as an ecosystem problem rather than just a large company problem. Because when mm. one of us is vulnerable, we're all vulnerable. We're all connected in some way. So I spent most of my career kind of playing in that space, uh, being a penetration tester, a red team, a social engineer. And now uh, after I've since been a consultant, um, being the CEO of an education company, which uh, is that interesting kind of contradiction between, you know, living what I've preached for a long time when I've been working with fast paced companies and actually building a company of my own. So. Hopefully, I've got some of those battle scars and those kind of stories that will be useful to your audience today. Indeed, indeed. I used to have here as well uh, at, at one point in the game. So uh, I uh, <laughs> apologize for the word veteran. Um, I, I'm apparently I'm not allowed to use the word expert either um, in, in the industry. So uh, so we'll find the right word eventually. But uh, but it's great it's great to have someone <laughs> of your experience uh, on the show uh, and 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 talking all about all about security. So so so. You know, obviously, your 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 business is about training people uh, and equipping people. Uh, here at Armadly, we're on a mission to make security accessible to people as well. People are fundamental to security and to business. Tell me, why why people? Why start with people? You know, a lot of people think that uh, you know security is AWS or it's your tech stack, you know, or it's your open environment or something like that. Um, but but why people? So for me, security isn't a tech problem at all. Well, in fact. I suppose it is a tech problem, but it's the oldest tech problem we have. So people are jerks. We have always been jerks to each other. When there is somebody who has something that you want or that you would benefit from having or you would like to disrupt their world in some way, as human beings, for as long as we have been human beings, we have applied the technology of the day to help us either get that item, to disrupt that item, to disrupt the world around us. And you know, it's part of our survival instinct. Um, we have coveted the things historically that, you know, helped us progress, helped us have children and eat and stay mm. safe from bears. 
what we've changed over time is a lot of the, the things that we cover and that we're looking for now are not necessarily as fundamental to life. And the technology that we have is not quite so visceral. So back in the day, if we were cave people, I'd have just grabbed a big rock or a big, you know, bit of a tree and, well, to put it bluntly, bash you a little bit with it. Um, it was highly unlikely I was going to try and negotiate. Um, all we've done over time is change the thing of value to, you know, increasingly it became money and those kind of things to then now data, information, access. Um, and then we've changed the technology from being a fairly crude assortment of, you know, instruments used for pain to um, now all the technologies that we have to gain access to expose uh, vulnerabilities in people in systems. And so for me, you can't jump into security and pretend it's not a people problem because if there were not people, there would be no problem. Um, mm. So for me, education and helping people come on this journey isn't about saying, hey, you should feel bad your, with your life choices. It's about saying, hey, we have instincts. We have things we do as human beings that make us a bit problematic to ourselves and our own survival. And so security becomes about taking individual responsibility, understanding individual context, and then applying those mm. skills in a way that changes the world a little bit and makes us a bit safer. Indeed, indeed. <clears throat> and so so it sounds like there's a couple of angles to that. There's there's the the bad actor angle, you know, where, like you say, humans are jerks, uh, can be jerks to each other. But there's also the diligence angle of, of de defending and being careful and being, you know, avoiding mistakes and things like that. Uh, you know, when we think about people and security, the first thing that comes to mind is sort of awareness training. Uh, uh, but it's more than that, isn't it? Tell me a little bit about uh, how you think about it, you know, in terms of helping train and educate people, not just from an yeah. awareness perspective, but beyond that. Now, I think we've simplified over the last few years, awareness training has become very commoditized. And we've simplified mm -hmm. the idea from, you know, this idea of people needing some way to stay safe to this very kind of cookie cutter and here's how we do it. And that's why you see so many players in that space, mm -hmm. um, us included. But it's it's really, for me, it's about switching on a bit of your brain that you had, you know, very active when you were young. You know, that part of you that meant that you would st stick a sandwich into a piece of expensive electronic equipment just to see what happened, or you'd be the person who went, well, I've got 10 fingers, what if I pressed all the buttons all at once? You had a natural curiosity when you were younger to explore the world and you didn't care about rules and physics you cared about well what happens next um, and what could this do for me now security as a skill set isn't just about understanding the law and regulations and compliance which is what we sometimes simplify it down to it's about making it feel okay to think about those things that are perhaps not the best things to do most of us uh, who get security awareness training and we're not criminals we're not bad people in sure. fact we've done our entire lives following the rules following the law and we've thrived because of it but because of that tendency to follow the law we've forgotten how vulnerable we can be and how things can be used in ways we hadn't expected and mm. so part of awareness training is about making it okay to say, yeah, the world's kind of rubbish. And it's okay to say, hey, look, I could totally steal your wallet right now. I can see how that would happen. It doesn't make you a criminal because you haven't done it. Thinking about that and enabling people to safely explore security is the key to us finding a way to protect all of us and our data and systems. Mm. So a common example of that, you know, there's many examples, but as, as, as you know, we're trying to sort of, people we don't recognize that are walking around the floor of our building, for example, to stop and say, hey, uh, when we're naturally inclined, maybe not to do that. Uh, and these stories, about, you know, people on their first day, uh, you know, a job stopping the CEO and saying, hey, uh, do you work here? Do we know you sort of thing? I absolutely did that as a, a rookie at KPMG. Um, so sorry, KPMG folks. Um, there was a gentleman walking around the office in his tennis gear at like five o'clock at night. And I'm like, hey, um, I'm sorry, but who are you? And no badge, <laughs> nothing. Uh, turns out he was a very, very, very senior partner. Um, and he was, was not best pleased at the time, uh, but he did send me a little gift a few days later when he was like, actually, you did the right thing. I was just a jerk when I responded to it. And yeah. if me as a security person, and we're quite awkward anyway to start with, we're not afraid of weird confrontation. Um, if I kind of got into a slight bit of trouble and felt awkward about doing it, then we've got to work extra hard to make sure those people who might be a little bit uh, less willing to do that feel safe mm. to do so. <clears throat> tell, tell me a little bit about the 
the education of developers because I know this is something that you know obviously you focus on quite a lot and it's a it's part of the it's part of the pro, it's part of the whole program really isn't it because we've got you know we've got we're just trying to treat people to think in ways uh, uh, you know stop the CEO in the corridors type of thing uh, but we've also got people who are deeply involved in the tech stack of the product you know, or, the, or the technical operations of the business as well uh, and, and security awareness and training and people training is about roles isn't it about role specific can you talk a little bit about that sure absolutely um, so I have been a software developer um, I, I've been um, you know some of the things I wish that were no longer in the world have my name on it, but they're still out there. Um, and building software, yeah, building software is a balance. There's a lot you have to get together at once. Performance, scalability, observability, usability, accessibility, all of these illities. And for a long time, security wasn't part of that. Now, part of what we do at SafeStack is help not just people writing the code, but all of the people who are involved in building software. So that's your developers, your testers, your analysts, your architects find ways to approach their role in software development and find ways to do security in it. Now, that sometimes means simplifying designs. Sometimes it means having a threat assessment before you've even got a line of code. But for me, it's all about making sure that we are taking a collaborative approach to securing the things that matter. Like, historically, we've loved to believe that, you know, this one person in security is going to save us all. They're going to be like Batman and swoop in and, you know, stop all the bad things from happening and we can all feel safe. But in reality, that doesn't scale. It doesn't work at all. The, the most successful uh, groups and organizations when it comes to security are those who share the responsibility across all people. And they give each role the skills they need and the tools they need to do it in a way that suits their world. So that's our part in this. So we work with now 105 organizations in seven countries. And there's thousands of organizations out there. So it's you know a big mission that we're taking on. But I think it's crucial that whatever organization you work in, understanding the roles you have and the impact they could have on your organization's security is kind of you know, table stakes. It doesn't matter what technology you employ in your company if the people don't know how to use it and why it's important. And everyone has a role to play in, and I think that's the, that's everyone, the, yeah. the big takeaway. Everyone, not just frontline staff or not just developers, but people who traditionally might not be seen as to be part of, you know, Play, and play a major part in the security uh, setup of an organization that they're very much involved in modern organizations recruit their entire team and power their entire team to be part of the part of the solution exactly and you see this in nature so i'm i'm a bit odd for a security person so those who've never encountered me before i do apologize uh, but think about meerkats uh, meerkats are an incredible collaborative defensive system so mm. even their teeny tiny pups are brought above ground from an early age and taught how to monitor for threats, those threats in their case being scorpions and things that can kill them, or humans. Um, and in their case, every single meerkat is taught how to respond to an emergency, what sound to make, where to run to, and they practice that frequently. And so nature shows us how this needs to be done in all sorts of ways. We just need to remember a little bit of ourselves. We, Because we have, as, as people, we make our careers as being exceptional individually, Sometimes we can overlook the power of working together collaboratively um, when it comes to security and safety. You now you could add a meerkat to your uh, safe stack. Uh, you know your your character. We, cast of we totally could. We absolutely could. <laughs> I'll, I'll put it on the list. Uh, you heard it here for the first team. <laughs> a new mascot appearing soon. Uh, so, so practically speaking, you know, a lot of people listening to this will be real. You know, maybe small organisations, small businesses, or, or indeed startups. Wondering where they can start or some practical things they can do. What what are some what are some key things people can start doing right now when it comes to, well, to people and security? So when we're talking about the people side, the first thing is to realize that it's everyone. And that means understanding who you've got and where and what they have access to. And it's not about taking things away, at least not yet. It's about saying, okay, what is my business really made of? And it's very rarely all of the things you think of straight away. It's also data in all sorts of places. So finding those tools, making it safe for people to say, hey, yeah, I've put my data here, here, and here, almost having an amnesty, if you will, across your team and saying, like, where is it all? What are you using? Um, that's kind of your foundation. So find your people, connect with them, make them realize or help them to realize that it's not about people going to be penalized or, you know, we're not here to say you're going to be fired if this uh, goes wrong. It's about a blameless approach to security. It's about saying, hey, what's the minimum security we each need to do to stay safe? 
Mm. And when you find all those systems, you can also start making good choices about the basic controls you give people. So authentication systems, for example, whether people use usernames and passwords when you choose to have multi-factor authentication, which should be a lot of the time, but sometimes it's not particularly practical. So really working through where the reality of people's roles meets the technology they're using. Yes. Now, as leaders, that can be quite eye-opening. You should always be going into that with a, I'm here to listen and learn. I'm not here to judge and give advice um, because you will shut down conversations very quickly if you come in aggressively saying, hey, no, that's wrong. Stop doing that. Um, and then once you've kind of got those relationships building and you're starting to understand where the data sits, how it's used and how people's worlds work, then you can start giving that kind of awareness education or the additional tooling and support that people need. Yeah, indeed, indeed. I really like that idea of taking a very blameless approach. I think security can very quickly become a accusational or, or blame blameful exercise, uh, even yeah. before anything's gone wrong. Uh, yeah, and, and I think the, the work that came out of Etsy even five years ago, uh, originally led by John Allspore, um, was really fundamental in how SafeStacks approached this. Um, it's very mm. easy, it's a cheap shot to say, hey, we had this problem, we had an incident, security went wrong, then it's your fault, Phil, get out. Um, and it makes us feel better. We controlled the thing. We got rid of the evil fill from the situation. Yeah. Someone had to but, pay the price. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. But that reassurance we feel doesn't necessarily represent the change in security that we achieved. Um, mm. Because if you put a new person in fill spot and you give them the same data, the same tooling, the same information, the same operating conditions, you're almost yes. guaranteed to get exactly the same outcome. So a blamelessness is unusual in security. I think it's still early days for us but I think it's increasingly important. Indeed, indeed. It's a failure of the, the, the environment and the system, isn't it? It's never just one, uh, it's never just one thing that goes wrong. It's, it's the person that was uh, up, you know, 3 a.m. in the morning, tired, who did this thing, whatever, and why were they allowed, you know, why were they in that environment to begin with? Absolutely yeah. not thinking of it as just a single point of failure, thinking of it as a, a failure of, of the collective system somehow. Yeah, and how to exactly. That. Yeah. Now, don't get me wrong, evil people still exist. I'm not saying that that 1% of people who would na naturally do something malicious don't exist, but they are the edge case, not the uh, the common case. Yeah, I really like that. Uh, and so in terms of uh, if dev, you know, people, technical folks, dev teams are, are listening to this, how can they start thinking about uh, security perhaps before, before they even write a line of code? What's something they could do right now? Well, the first thing that I would encourage all development teams to do is to stop thinking about security as about compliance and regulation and start thinking about it like quality. I truly believe that almost every engineer I've met cares that they're doing a good job, that they're building good quality systems, that they're not having to come and rework things afterwards because nobody wants to do that. They don't, don't want to be dealing with incidents because it's all gone wrong. And so if you treat security as part of quality, then it has to be there. It's kind of like saying, well, I have to do this. It's just part of my role. Um, yes. And when it's there, it balances because you're thinking about it at the same time as you're thinking about scaling and performance and design, all those other things. Mm -hmm. It's not left too late. It's very, very difficult and very painful to adjust the security of a system once it's actually been built. Yes. Yes. So just doing it early and often is really powerful. The other thing is don't overcook it. Security isn't about you spending a million dollars on three tools and putting them in your very perfect CI CD pipeline, which none of us actually have. It's okay, spoilers ahead. Not even the big unicorns have perfect CI CD in every single team. Um, it's about acknowledging that it needs to happen all of the time. And it's about your mindset. If your idea of security is you just get a big whiteboard, you draw the scrappiest, most ugly architecture diagram you've ever seen on it, and you grab the team together and go, all right, so let's just kind of think differently here. If I was going to go evil, what would I do to do this? Then that's going to be a phenomenally powerful exercise, not just for you as an individual engineer, but for your wider team. Yeah. And every technology you bring in, every change you make, every time you embrace something exciting, have one of those moments where you could go, well, all right, so how could this go wrong? And it's yeah. not about being the negative person. It's not being about that cynical tinfoil hat thing. It's about going, all right, cool. Here's an opportunity. Here's something as an engineer I need to address. And that plays to your natural instinct as engineers rather than forcing you to kind of think like an auditor, which that's not going to help anyone. That's great. That's great. So taking a really preventative approach. And, and it can be a pretty quick conversation too, can't I mean, to save a whole lot of, a whole lot of drama down the road potentially. 
uh, add right into the process. I really like that idea about how it's not a, you know, QA or, or sort of quality assurance used to be this thing after the fact, it used to be people that came in sort of separately and tested something for you and then sent you a whole lot, you know, a whole lost list of things. But, but that's very much changed in terms of, you know, people owning quality themselves um, and, and really owning it across the team right, right through the product. And I love the fact that security is heading that way as well, that every person should be responsible for it fundamentally themselves, but part of a wider, part of a wider team that's actually, actually building it into the process as opposed to treating it as an afterthought or something that's, that's checked after it's done, which is horrendously inefficient uh, in, in that sense. So moving into security leadership, in, in the businesses, what can a security leader do uh, to make uh, to, to, to to help their organisation? So it's not just all about auditing and compliance, but really just about security in general. What can they do? Yeah, I, it's really hard being a security leader, um, especially if your company's going fast. Um, there's so mm. much. You know, it, saying I look I look after security is like saying I'm going to move to Europe. It's, you know, it's a lot of things. It's the not things, one place. It's, it's, thing, yeah, it's huge. Exactly. Um, yeah. And so it can be very, very tempting to treat it just like audit. And you're like, well, audit gives me this framework, so I'll just kind of tick the boxes and then I'm done. Um, I've been the virtual CISO for a number of very high growth companies around the world. And what it taught me is in its own way to be lazy as a security person. And that, don't misunderstand me on this, let me explain. It's automation has to be your friend in security like automation helps you do things consistently it helps you not lose track of things it helps you do more than one person's work when you've got nowhere near enough people or resource to get a job done mm -hmm. and i think this all ties together with the education piece right when you've got automation to take care of the the things that have to happen frequently that you need to remember you've got education to equip your team to help you with the job then you can move your role from being just about audit to being about that improving the general stance of the company through collaboration and teamwork. You don't want to feel like at the end of the day that, you know, going back to that blameless culture thing, that you as a security leader are going to be on the line if there's a mistake. You want it to be that if there was a mistake, if something bad happened, that as a team, you would come together and have a blameless postmortem and go, actually, this is where we could have done this better as a team. So mm. automation to get those basics done, collaboration to share the load, um, is really going to change this, um, I think, for the future, for the better. Indeed, indeed. And that automation story is really powerful. We're seeing people get so much more done uh, than that. It used to take many, many people. Uh, it used to be very people, you know, uh, labor, labor intensive work where we're seeing people get a lot more done with a lot less, which is really great, uh, you know, from yeah. a security perspective. Well, um, if you look at this in terms of in unemployment in the cybersecurity, they estimate at the moment we have 3.5 million open roles globally in cybersecurity, which means that if you're re watching this today and you're like, yeah, I've got an open vacancy and I can't fill it, it's not just you, it's everyone. So, yes. you know, yes, there's lots of things we can do in talent development and training people up. But the other side of this is we have to embrace automation because it's the only way we're going to be able to compensate for the massive skill shortage we have. Yeah, indeed, indeed. Can you talk a little bit about the difference? Of just you mentioned compliance as well. Like the difference between compliance and security. You know, for many people, they're the same thing, right? Uh, I do the compliance, I check the boxes, I do all these things, I'm good, right? Um, yeah. We know that's not true. Can you tell us a little bit? You know, share your thoughts on that. Yeah. Now, uh, apologies. I have very strong feelings and opinions on this. So you know, <laughs> the, the following represents my own opinion. Please don't tar fill with the same brush as me. Um, Compliance is your license to operate. Compliance, whether it's from government legislation or whether it's from a compliance scheme like PCIDSS, that's from an industry regulation body, um, they're there to say, hey, we trust you. So we being the government organization or the industry body, we trust you to operate with us and you're not going to screw up our reputation while we do it. That's essentially what they're saying. Um, now, that's okay, but it's not about your risk. It's about the risk of the organization who you are kind of complying with. So PCIDSS, it's about can Visa trust you to handle credit card information in a way that won't put the Visa brand at risk of massive fraud problems or, you know, brand uh, reputation loss. Um, there's a few exceptions to that, like ISO, which is an international standard, and that one is more generic. So ISO itself doesn't really have much of a say, but they have to maintain the quality of that standard to keep 
the the quality of it so that there's people buy audits so that people uh, yeah. comply with it yeah it's, it's that business model now security isn't about that security isn't about somebody else's issues it's not about their reputation it's about you it's about your organization as compliance is saying i meet a regulation i meet a requirement security is saying i understand risk and i'm taking steps to prevent it detect it or respond to it um now there's overlap Many compliance regimes require you to do things that would help you with security, but security is much broader than just compliance itself. And security has to happen 24-7, 365 days. So yes. compliance can feel like it's just a one-off. You know, I got the auditor in next week, we'll get it done, done for another year. Great, fantastic, good job team. Unfortunately, it's kind of like being on a, a mission to stay healthy. Uh, trying to stay secure is the same thing. You have to practice those behaviors every single day. Um, and things are always changing. It's always going to push you. It's always going to feel hard. Mm -hmm. So um, compliance has its place, but it's not going to keep you secure. It's going to keep you in business. Indeed. It's a little bit like, I sometimes think of it like, like compliance is like uh, getting the warrant fitness for your cars. You know, someone checks it, someone, you pass, you know, pass a few things, it's, you're good to go. But in between that, you still have to keep things running. You, you need to maintain it. It needs to, needs to be roadworthy. Whether you're, yeah, it, whether it's a whether moment in time assessment. So yeah. it says that this Tuesday at, you know, 4.50 p.m., your vehicle was effective and safe. But yeah. any time after that and before that, you know, there's no evidence, there's no uh, um, certification that says otherwise. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, indeed. And so, so you know, my contention is that companies really need to stay diligent with security. They need to build it from a principles-based approach first and foremost, and then get compliance as a as an extra measure on top of that if, if and kind of when it's needed, if it's, you know, it's often uh, opens up sort of new avenues to doing business and things like that and provides an external sense of validation of what you're doing. Um, but it's not replacement for for fundamentally a foundational security program, which is which is what every organization needs. Um, yeah, absolutely. You've, you've got two different sets of motivators there. You know, it's normally a commercial driven um, experience to go down compliance or regulation. You know, you need it to do what you're trying to do to yeah. sell to those customers. But to keep your lights on, to keep your people, your data and your systems safe, that's security, mm -hmm. not compliance. So that has to be every day, whether somebody is asking for it publicly or not. Yeah, indeed, indeed. Well, look, uh, Laura, it's been a pleasure. I think uh, we're at time. So uh, thank you once again. And now if anyone has questions they would like to ask either myself or Laura, Please, uh, please leave them as a comment on this uh, this post, and we will uh, we will look at those, we'll read those, and we will do our best to help you out and answer those questions. So, uh, we'd love to hear from you. Please, uh, please like and subscribe, support what we're doing, uh, and uh, we'll look forward to talking further with you. Thank you again, Laura. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, Phil. Take care. Cheers. Thanks, everyone. Bye.